thoughts, quotes that guide the way that I, I live my life, I have tattooed on my arms. The first is, discipline is my freedom. The second one is, hold fast, stay true. That's a nautical term that has its history all the way back to the British Navy. And it was a term that the sailors used when they were transiting in a stormy weather. I'm Brian Gilman. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of Warriors and Quiet Waters Foundation, and I'm a retired United States Marine. I grew up in Butte, Montana. Butte's a blue collar town. It's a, a hard rock mining town, once known as the richest hill on earth, had the, the largest copper mine in the world. People in Butte worked hard and were very proud of what they did and the living that they made and the way that they made it, and that really bound the community together. I tell everyone Montana is my geographical fulcrum. It's that place where I'm anchored to. My family's been here in Montana since the 1860s. We're deeply tied to the land. We're deeply tied to the traditions. We're deeply tied to the, the way of doing things in Montana. Initially, I was a pretty shy kid, but Butte, Montana is a, a pretty rough town. And by the time I was in middle school, I was just like every other kid. I was an athlete and loved to play hard. I remember admiring United States Marines when I was a young kid, about nine years old, um, reading a lot of, of books about reconnaissance Marines in Vietnam. I had a couple really good buddies that enlisted right after high school. I went on to college and during that time was the Gulf War. These two buddies of mine were fighting overseas in the Marine Corps. And with that, I really felt a call to service. I was playing football in college, playing for the Montana Tech Ore Diggers. The head coach was Coach Bob Green. Um, he was a radio operator in Vietnam and really admiring Coach Green's leadership and just the way that he communicated and led that team really is what pushed me over the edge to call the Marine Corps and tell them I wanted to join. My transition into the Marine Corps was pretty chaotic. It was a shock. It was a culture shock. It was a shock living in such close proximity to so many other officer candidates and the training was designed to break me down as an individual and rebuild me as a member of a team and that's that's a an arduous chaotic process. I had been assigned a brand new military occupational specialty in the Marine Corps called Ground Intelligence Officer. This MOS was created based out of lessons learned from the Gulf War to create an intelligence officer that had more of an operational perspective. We first qualified as infantry officers, then we went on and uh, uh, went through intel training. I initially served as a scout sniper platoon commander of 1st Battalion, 1st Marines. Later on in my career, I was qualified as a ground reconnaissance officer. The primary reason why I picked that occupational specialty is because it was the most direct route into reconnaissance forces in the Marine Corps. Reconnaissance forces were really designed to, to gain and maintain contact with the enemy. I wanted to serve with Marines that were the best. After 9-11, I deployed four times to combat. I first deployed in Operation Iraqi Freedom during the initial invasion of Iraq as a company commander with 1st Reconnaissance Battalion. I deployed nine months later back with the same battalion, this time as its battalion operations officer around Fallujah, Iraq. I deployed later on in my career in 2009-2010 to Operation Enduring Freedom in Afghanistan, this time as a member of the Task Force Leatherneck staff. This was a forward element of 1st Marine Division that was de deployed to Helmand Province. And in that role, I led all of the intelligence operations for the division during that deployment. I redeployed to Afghanistan nine months later as the commanding officer of 1st Reconnaissance Battalion, where I led that battalion in combat operations in Helmand Province. When I was a colonel, I was selected to command the Marine Raider Training Center, which is the unit responsible for all the training in Marine Special Operations Command. The thing that was really special were the Marines. These were Marines that were assessed and selected through a very arduous, formal process. Seeing the things that these Marines, once they were trained, were able to do individually and collectively was, it was really a great way to end my career. You lead Marines by knowing your stuff and setting the example and leading the way. You lead Marines by having a bias for action. You lead Marines by by enabling your Marines to perform the duties that they've been assigned to, and that's through ensuring that they're well-trained in every aspect of their job, ensuring that they understand commander's intent, they understand the mission, they understand how the operation is gonna be conducted, and they're given the, the room to make decisions within that framework. Leadership is part of the core of being a United States Marine. It's something that you're taught at a very young age, it's something you're expected to perform well at very young ranks, and that only builds from there in the Marine Corps. The best way that I think I can sum that up is by quoting General Mattis, who said about command, the privilege of command is command. That's how I felt about it. It was a privilege and it was an honor. It was something that I had to earn every day. And I thought about that fact every single day. I think the most profound lesson that I learned as a commander were a couple things. Number one, the absolute requirement to set the example in everything that you did because your Marines are always watching you whether you think they are or not. The second one was really finding ways to enable those subordinate leaders to lead 
and to make decisions. My last command, I led a unit that was over 500 people. I came here to Warriors of Quiet Waters and when I joined the team, we had 11 people, including myself. The biggest difference was the diffuse power structure in a, in a nonprofit. As a commander, by law, I had ultimate authority. Every decision was mine to make. It's a lot different in a nonprofit organization in the civilian world. There are very few decisions I make without consulting with others because they're all stakeholders that have a stake in what this organization does and how it does it. That's probably the biggest transition for me has been working within that diffuse power structure and building a lot of consensus and situational awareness amongst that stakeholder base, getting a lot of feedback before making any big decisions. All the leadership principles and things that you learned as a leader in the military apply in the civilian world. Their application is different and that will vary from organization to organization, but every bit of that applies. The culture in the military is much different from the culture in the civilian world. As a leader, it's your job to determine whether or not that culture is working for you and if it's not, to start building the fundamentals of the culture that you need and really making your people in that organization, your members of the team, understand the importance of that and understand the why behind everything that you're doing. It's got to start with the why. The most intense experiences I'll ever have were, were in the Marine Corps, but I've been accused of being an optimist and I think that really the keys to having a thriving life as a civilian, as a veteran, is to find a way to live your life with purpose and find meaning in what you do. And I think if you have that, then the sky's the limit. You can still have a lot of best days ahead of you. I'm a fairly type A personality, so I have a routine. Every morning I get up early, somewhere between 4 and 5 a.m., and I spend the first hour every day drinking coffee and reading. That's my time to invest in myself. I will go into my home gym and I'll work out for typically about an hour. After that, I'll put my food together for the day. I manage my nutrition pretty carefully. Every day is different at Warriors and Quiet Waters is the CEO. Just about every day is going to involve meetings. It's going to involve a bunch of phone calls. It's going to involve uh, a whole bunch of email, unfortunately, but that's what comes with the job. And a lot of opportunities to sit down and problem solve and to vision through how to deliver Gold Star programming to our participants. Solitude in the outdoors gives me peace. That's where I go to clear my mind. That's where I go to find my center. The first place I find meaning and purpose is my family. I got two young teenage sons and a, a wife of 22 years, and they're the most important thing in my life. And being a leader in my family, being a provider in my family, and being a protector in my family all give me meaning and purpose purpose every single day. Setting the example for my kids, helping them to become the men that I hope they'll be. Beyond that, service and leadership, which is why, once again, I'm so blessed to be a member of this Warriors and Quiet Waters team. I get the opportunity every single day to serve my fellow veterans, to serve the members of my team, to serve my board of directors, to serve our volunteers, to serve our donors, and to lead a, a tremendous team that's really trying to have a major impact on the lives of post 9-11 combat veterans and their loved ones. Warriors in Quiet Waters has always enabled post 9-11 combat veterans and their loved ones to find peace, meaning, and purpose through inspirational activities outdoors, mostly fly fishing. In the coming year, we're working hard right now to provide additional value and to provide a lot more depth to that process by bringing in a guided discovery process into our programs. Who am I? Your identity is lost when you leave the service. What can I do? What's my potential? What are my values? And finally, what does a life of purpose look like for me? How am I going to find purpose and meaning now that I'm no longer in the military? We've established a program model that's going to put nature to work, helping our participants answer those questions by creating opportunities for them to come to epiphanies around these big questions that need to be answered. Our first step towards moving in that direction with our programming is our newest program called Hunt for Purpose. Hunt for Purpose is a six-month program built around archery elk hunting to use the act of preparing for and conducting an archery elk hunt in order to enable participants to speed to the answers to those big questions that I talked about. We picked archery elk hunting because archery elk hunting is hard and you have to prepare for it in order to be a successful archery elk hunter. You have to be physically fit. You have to be spiritually fit. You have to be mentally fit. That's what the whole program is built around, to provide opportunities for our participants to build strength in each of these different domains of their life. What makes Warriors and Quiet Waters Foundation differ from other VSOs? I believe it's three things. Our people, our place, and our program and the way that we are able to bring those three things together to create an environment that enables our warrior participants and their family members to trust us, to be open to the vulnerability that's required in order to grow, to find respite in nature, and to grasp and grapple with what a thriving life as a veteran looks like for them going forward and getting them to a place where they're able to make the commitment to take those positive steps that will make them resilient and will help them find a life of purpose.